Hi, I'm Adhan Shazli. I'm a PhD student uh, at the Faculty of Philosophy, University of Cambridge, and I'm also a member of Claire Hall. Hi, I'm uh, Helena Scott Fortsman. I'm a postdoc at the Department for History and Philosophy of Science at University of Cambridge, and I'm also a research fellow here at uh, Claire Hall. So, Helena, we've been involved in a research group together over the past year that have met almost uh, weekly actually uh, at Claire Hall. And the aim of that research group was to bring together philosophers from different backgrounds, uh, specifically epistemologists, um, or philosophers of knowledge, uh, and philosophers of science, into our conversations about sort of classical issues in philosophy. But our aim was to kind of shed new light onto them, both by perhaps uh, advancing or asking new questions, but also thinking about the methods that we do um, philosophy. Right, so um, we've met and, and discussed these types of issues in, uh, in the context of other people's texts. And so each week we've, we've read a text by some other philosopher and, and discussed it in a group. But we've also, um, you know, had lunch together at Clare Hall, discussed philosophy and, and, and had discussions in breaks of other academic events and, and sort of found that our projects have some sorts of, of similarities, but also some differences. And we wanted to talk a bit more about uh, our particular, con um, particular projects and, um, and these similarities and differences. So perhaps you want to start by telling us something about your PhD project and, and, your, and the aims of, of what you're working on right now. So I'm, uh, I do epistemology, which is a fancy word for theory of knowledge. So I'm interested in how we know things, um, how we learn things, uh, why is that sort of valuable, how do we communicate our knowledge to others. So for example, think about uh, education. So, but my specific research project is about what it means to understand something as opposed to sort of merely know, uh, merely know it. So think in the context of education, for example, uh, where a teacher might impart kind of a description of a certain phenomena, I don't know, of climate change, for example, to the students. And the student might well sort of memorize it, kind of textbook knowledge, uh, and, you know, rehearse that knowledge in, in the exam. But if the students sort of only memorized uh, these bunch of facts, uh, but really didn't know how to think about them and wasn't able to kind of manipulate these facts in any meaningful way, we would think that they lack uh, understanding. So I'm sort of interested in, in the difference there. And sort of more broadly, um, this is backgrounded by an interest in epistemology that I have. So over the last century, epistemologists have sort of tended to focus on a very discreet and sort of narrow uh, analysis of knowledge. So they conceive knowledge as kind of relation to individual items uh, of fact and the way that they sort of thought about uh, evaluation uh, of that state was also similarly sort of narrow. But I'm interested in how, not just how we know individual facts, but how we sort of systematize and synthesize uh, these items into kind of a uh, cognitive network or cognitive structure. And I take uh, sort of my description of what's happening there uh, with the aid of uh, sort of cognitive network science and semantic, uh, semantic network memory and put that into work in explaining what uh, it means to understand something. Right. Yeah. So, um, as I already hinted at, we, we have discussed some of these things sort of briefly uh, before. And, uh, and I know that in addition to this sort of more philosophical, um, let's say, interest in, in, in contributing to epistemology, there's also a more personal or mm. sort of fascination-based reason that you're engaging in this project of, of um, understanding, understanding. Yeah, so perhaps you want to want to share this uh, this sort of fascination. Why why is why is understanding a fascinating topic too? So sort of as a personal note, <clears throat> a lot of the philosophical topics that interest me stem from something that I lack and admire in other people, and one of those things is uh, understanding. Um, so I really admire sort of my teachers' uh, grasp of of their topic 
how they sort of go about thinking about um, their topic and kind of create new ways of thinking about it as well. So in my, as a kind of more personal anecdote, in my master's, um, my supervisor was actually a historian of philosophy, so he, he was a Descartes scholar. So Descartes scholarship is really like a well-treaded area of philosophy. So we know everything about Descartes that there, there is to know. If you know his view about this, about that, what he said in this text, what he said in that text, there's nothing new to know. Right? However, there's a lot of uh, kind of room for understanding. Uh, and my own supervisor was, I think, sort of an ex exemplary uh, uh, instance of that. The way that he synthesized already known items of information about Descartes, he took that and synthesized it into kind of a creative and insightful way of explaining Descartes' philosophy, perhaps by using some of the information and making, making it more central, for example, put it in, putting it into kind of more explanatory work with respect to other information. And these kind of, these, this way of systematizing information, I think, are telltale signs of understanding a sort of a cognitive achievement that we often admire and want to emulate. Uh, yeah. So this is sort of my project, but it also weaves into uh, some of your interests, uh, actually, uh, that we've discussed in, in the research group. So would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Right, so, so I do, as I already said, philosophy of science. More specifically, I do philosophy of medicine. And mm. that means that what I sort of think about or work, work on are questions around um, how doctors practice uh, medicine, how they know medical things about patients, uh, how they go about using that knowledge and, and, uh, mm. and so on. And, um, so I'm particularly interested in medicine as it, as it, as it occurs in the clinic um, and philosophical or knowledge related questions as to the as pertaining to the clinic. Um, but in this work with trying to make philosophical sense of medical practice, um, I've come across this sort of issue that philosophy tends to think a lot about things, but based on um, idealized notions or preconceived concepts of what medicine means. Mm -hmm. So when we do philosophy of medicine, we think about some sort of idealized notion of medicine, and then we try and, and understand uh, medical uh, knowledge based on these idealized notions. And I um, uh, wanted to do philosophy that was much closer to practice. And when I started out doing uh, philosophy of medicine, uh, I thought that the way I would go about this was to sort of do philosophy of medicine and then talk a bit to doctors about mm. whether that seemed plausible and, and so on. But it very quickly turned out that um, philosophers and doctors have very different frameworks and very different languages. Um, and sort of trying to ask doctors whether philosophy is meaningful uh, doesn't just um, immediately make sense. Mm -hmm. So what I then did to try and... Uh, sort of relate my work much more um, uh, in a much more integrated way to uh, medical practice was that I did started doing ethnographic field work. So that means going out and sort of walking behind the doctor all day, taking notes, interviewing them, sort of being in the clinical space um, mm. for, for weeks and months uh, at a time to, to really get a sense of, of the medical context and then do your philosophical work based on um, based on the information that you get uh, out of this type of, of work. Yeah. So an, sort of an interesting side note is that we both started off in medicine before we uh, ended up in, in philosophy somehow. But sort of more to your point, um, one question I have in mind is, so what distinguishes your work uh, as philosophy of medicine and not ethnography or sociology of medicine, given the more sort of practice-oriented bent um, of your work? Right, so this is a, a question that I actually get quite often in sort of two versions. So either I get uh, the question about whether I'm even doing philosophy, am I not mm. doing anthropology or sociology because I'm using this type of, of method, or the other version of the question, which is why do you care so much about uh, your disciplinary <laughs> belongings? Like, is, does it even matter? Aren't we all sort of interdisciplinary? Mm. Um, and I think it does matter, and I do think that the work that I'm doing is different from sociology. And the way that I've um, sort of thought about it is that um, 
So I think philosophy shares a lot of things with sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, mm -hmm. sort of other other of these types of, of um, academic practices, mm -hmm. in that it aims exactly at understanding. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't uh, the, the sort of target of, of philosophy or of anthropology is not. Um, facts, but understanding the relation between these facts and the ways in which these uh, specific practices, so be it um, Danish orthopedic surgery, which is, is what I've been, been looking at, uh, how exactly uh, those uh, types of contexts are structured mm. and getting a grasp of really how they function and, and evolve and yeah. how they even can be manipulated. So I think there's a broad interest in understanding but I think the difference when you do philosophy rather than sociology is, is in the level of, of understanding that you're aiming at. So uh, although sociology can be very uh, theoretical as well, mm -hmm. uh, the aim of sociology is typically to gain understanding of particular uh, context, particular social structures. And sociology fails, so to speak, if it fails to, to have understood those types of, mm -hmm. of contexts. Whereas I think, on the other hand, the aim of philosophical understanding is more about um, gaining conceptual understanding that can transfer to a lot of other contexts. Right. So giving us some understanding of what it means to hold knowledge, what it means to inquire, that doesn't uh, necessarily only work in that particular context, but have like a broader, broader framework of understanding. Right. And in this sense, philosophy the failure of philosophy doesn't sort of hinge on understanding that particular cultural phenomenon, but rather right. on whether uh, you develop an uh, interesting and helpful uh, concepts. Mm -hmm. So in a way, philosophy um, involves a certain kind of conceptual abstraction or the same kind of conceptual work. But I think what brings together our own uh, way of doing philosophy um, is a view of what this conceptual work involves, right? So on the one hand, there is a kind of tradition in philosophy, it's called conceptual analysis, that's been kind of dominant over the last perhaps 100, uh, 100 and so years, which is really focused on kind of, focus on a certain concept, break it down into necessary and sufficient conditions, um, and that's supposed to be kind of illuminating. So in a way, let's just focus on our language and break down the in individual concepts um, that, that are there. But what we're interested in, uh, partly because we're interested in illuminating practice, so you're interested in illuminating medical practice, I'm interested in education, how we educate and how we sort of design educational um, uh, practices and so on. Because we're interested in this uh, very complex and in a way messy context, this kind of neat conceptual analysis is not going to work. We're interested in a different kind of conceptual project. Uh, a product that kind of speaks to theory, but also makes practice um, uh, sort of, uh, speaks to theory and theory speaks to practice in a, in a fruitful and meaningful way. Right. So this is something that uh, I think in recent philosophy is sometimes spoken about as conceptual engineering. Right. That is this idea that you know the task of philosophers is, is not to just unpack uh, concepts that already exist, but to mm. engineer and actually construct concepts that are helpful to uh, whatever we want to do with those particular uh, concepts and they might vary depending on the aims of, of what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, but I think what we've been discussing in the research uh, group that we've been, been meeting at over the past year and also what our, our projects, both each of them enlighten, is that um, maybe sort of neither of us are completely in the concept analyses mm -hmm. or concept engineering ca camp if those are different camps, uh, but more sort of somewhere in between where we try to actually pay attention to mm. phenomena as they already exist and right. describe them really well, but also to think more um, sort of uh, specifically about ways in which those phenomena have not been described and helpful ways of reframing those phenomena right. so that, that we don't construct from nothing, nothing as it were. Right. Right. Which puts us in an interesting way to understand what philosophy is or how it should be done. We are reading a paper in our, uh, in our reading group about what philosophy is, but we kind of ended up with thinking, perhaps we should kind of put that question a little bit to the side and then think about uh, what makes philosophy useful and relevant 
uh, in the way that we've just uh, sort of been talking about. Right, so there's this joke that uh, you're not a proper philosopher until you've written an essay about what right. philosophy is. Right. But, uh, Sort of Which we haven't we done should, yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should write an essay about what uh, relevant philosophy is. Yeah. 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 That, uh, thank you. Jane. Thank you.